The teachings of General Conference are the considerations the Lord would have before us now and in the months ahead. Our marching orders for each six months are found in the General Conference addresses. For the next six months, your conference edition of the Ensign should stand next to your standard works and be referred to frequently. I encourage you to read the talks once again and to ponder the messages contained therein. I exhort you to study the messages of this conference frequently, even repeatedly, during the next six months. You're listening to the Conference Talk Podcast, where it's conference weekend every weekend. Each weekend, we discuss talks from the most recent General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's right. We'll share some insights, make some connections, and have a bit of fun as we study the words of the awesome men and women that God has called to direct His Church in these, the latter days. I'm Shelby Stanfill. And I'm Shelby, also Christensen. This episode, we're talking about Sister Tamara Runia's talk, Seeing God's Family Through the Overview Lens. And we're also joined today with a special guest, Tammy Barnett. Hi, Tammy. Hey, guys. Tammy, we're so excited to have you. I am so excited to be here. And General Conference every weekend sounds perfect to me. Let's let's do it. Tammy and Shelby, what were some of your favorite things from Sister Runia's talk? Oh, gosh, there were a lot in this one. This conference talk definitely stood out to me this last time as kind of this beautiful, perfect um, uh, talk to a company. President Nelson's Think Celestial Talk, truly. I felt like the two of them complemented each other super, super well. Um, so I, I actually like to study them together. But um, I, as a mother of six children, <laughs> um, where things are often busy and loud and there's so many, so much energy in my home, truly. Um, the part that was probably my absolute favorite because it's counsel that I need to be reminded of on the regular was about our words being our superpower. And it took me back to, um, and it actually was awesome because it lined up with our come follow me study at the time in James, you know, which reminded us of, um, the power of the tongue and then took me on a little detour on over to elder Holland's talk about the tongue of angels, which has a lot of really great counsel in it. Um, so that would be another talk to line up with this one. It's a really good one, but, um, she quoted, um, saying it, um, you should ask that we should ask ourselves is what I'm about to do or say helpful or hurtful. Our words are one of our superpowers and family members are like human blackboards standing in front of us saying, write what you think of me. These messages, whether intentional or unintentional, should be hopeful and encouraging. And I think, gosh, it's so true. We are all just asking for others to, you know, say, who am I to you? Who am I? What am I? You know, and and we need that hope and encouragement. It can be so easy to slip into the other to be critical. And I needed that reminder as a mother, for sure. I love that part too. And I also really love um, where it says, this is a quote from her talk that I absolutely loved. It says, remember, families are a God-given laboratory where we're figuring things out. So missteps and miscalculations are not just possible, but probable. And I absolutely loved that because it made me feel a little bit more like, okay, it's okay that we make mistakes, but what we need to do in those relationships moving forward is try to do better and be better, right? This, this concept of repentance within the family. And it's no wonder that some of the hardest people to love, I'm willing to bet, are somewhere in your family <laughs> because you know them so well. Usually, you know them pretty well. And so you're able to see their flaws a little bit more and then be a little bit more criticizing than you would just your average friend that you have, right? And so families really are this factory (laughs) to be able to figure out these missteps and miscalculations and move forward in these relationships and to show that love and watch what what we're saying with our tongue, what you were talking about, Tammy, right? How that can be one of the biggest things. Our, our families really are walking blackboards. And that has stuck with me ever since she said that. Like, it's not left my mind anytime I talk to my daughter or even my husband. I'm like, who are they? One of the biggest actually pieces of advice we got when we were married was remember who you're talking to. 
And that was the best advice I ever got because since we got married, I always try to look at my husband and now my daughter as who am I talking to? And that person is obviously a child of God. So how would I talk to them? And that helps me figure out these things. But when you're in the heat of the moment, sometimes it's really hard. (laughs) And so these reminders are definitely necessary. So I'm grateful for Sister Runia for bringing them back for this conference. (laughs) Definitely. You know, I did this training once at work. I used to be in management and healthcare. And it was a Stephen Covey training, actually. And in it, it said, where it matters most, we typically do our worst. Because where we feel safest, um, we let all of the things show that we would not ever, we, we let our guard down in ways we don't in other places. And so we let the people closest to us see our most vulnerable, most ugly, most awkward, most, you know, all the things, right? That's where we do our worst. And so it is, that's why the family really is a perfect God-given laboratory um, because we're going to be tested and tried to be patient and compassionate and kind and, you know, and using, because you do feel safe to potentially offer, like who who else could offer that constructive criticism, but is it helpful? that I actually say that thing or is it not? And often, most often, it's actually not. And I did another training through the church long time ago where um, they talked about the power of labels and how we have to be so careful how we label ourselves and our loved ones because we will live up to those labels. And so just to think about making sure that our words are hopeful and encouraging and they will rise to that, right? Right. Um, it's just important. And, and all of that came back to my mind as I was reading her words. Mm, I really love those thoughts. And going along with that, it reminded me of the story that she shares about in the beginning when she talks about how she was going through a trying time as a teenager and um, that she said that she remembered seeing her mom crying and she wondered if she had disappointed her mom. And um, But then something that her dad did, which like this just like really hit me because I tend to be the one who is more likely to correct and to criticize, point out the flaws, like, Hey, you're doing this wrong. You're doing this wrong. Let's do it this way. Kind of thing rather than just like be silent and just love and like, let them figure it out themselves. And I love how she shared about her dad, how he practiced the zooming out and taking the long view. Um, he, it wasn't, it didn't mean that he didn't worry about her or anything, but he just stood back. He loved her. He let her know that he was in her corner. He let her know that he was her cheerleader. And then she, she remembered that years later. Um, and how he would send her letters when she was in college, like reminding her of who she was. And I put, um, it, I underlined here, everybody needs a cheerleader. And that's who we're supposed to be for our kids, not just our kids, but like, all of our family, especially those who may not be um, in the gospel or may have strayed away. Um, and then the our friends and our peers outside of the gospel, they need us to be their cheerleaders in their lives, even if their lives don't align with what we, what we think is the right way to live, right? Um, but for me, a note that I made is, as a mom, my kids need me to remind them who they are be their cheerleader and remind them that they can. And um, I have a a family friend who this reminded me of her. She has five kids and um, only, so two of her five kids have left the church. It's her oldest son and her youngest son have left the church. And um, both of them made some very different choices and, um, hard choices with their lives to the point where she kicked them out of the house. They were not allowed to come home if they were going to partake in the lifestyle that they were partaking in. And um, she still loved them and they still felt that. Like they still had a relationship. They just knew that they weren't allowed to come live with her if they were going to be living the life that they were living. And then her oldest son, he went through um, some addiction issues and substance abuse issues. And he went through a really nasty divorce. He hit rock bottom and he came to her. He said, mom, I need to come home. And she let him come home. And so it just, I don't know. It just reminded me of that. Like 
she said she was still firm and he knew what she believed, like what she believed and what she stood for, but she still had that love for him to be in his corner and to allow him to, to come back to her so he could find his footing again without criticism. I love that. And it reminds me of the quote where, where she says, uh, talking about Lehi's dream, this is what she did. You stay where you are and call them. You go to the tree, stay at the tree, keep eating the fruit, and with a smile on your face, continue to beckon those you love and show by example that eating the fruit is a happy thing, right? She stayed at the tree and then I'm sure guided by the spirit when rock bottom hit, she knew it's time for them to come to the tree with me, right? It's time for them to come home. And I just love that example. I love this whole staying at the tree analogy. (laughs) It just makes me so hopeful. Yeah, it's that was absolutely one of my favorite parts too, because, and I just really was pondering what does it look like to stay at the tree? Because, you know, in, in my mind, I'm picturing in Lehi's vision, like you don't, what does it mean to not wander from it? It means not to wander back into the mist of darkness where there's confusion, where you're feeding your doubts, where you're, um, maybe entertaining things that you shouldn't entertain. Just it's keeping the sure footing of your testimony centered in Jesus Christ, um, and his gospel, but it doesn't mean we don't meet people where they're at. It doesn't mean that we don't. Um, I think it means that we have boundaries like your friend. Um, I think that it means we have to hold those boundaries, but sometimes we also need to know where, when and how we can meet them where they're at to be open, to be, to, to show that compassion to them, to let them feel the savior's love through us. Right. Um, so I did, I absolutely love that analogy. And I also loved how she talked about like, it's not enough to just stay at the tree and that the memory of the fruit isn't enough. You have to keep partaking because that's, you know, that's when Satan sneaks in, you take the fruit and you think the memory is enough of that, but that's when the adversary sneaks in and, and you become vulnerable. Staying at the tree means constantly partaking of the fruit. And I really actually, it hit me hard. I thought, am I exemplifying to my family the joy that comes from the fruit of the gospel? Like, am I exemplifying that? Or am I showing them that maybe it's super stressful to keep up with all the things? Am I living a gospel of lists and it maybe looks hard or difficult? Like I need to be exemplifying for my family, the joy of daily repentance, the joy of participating in the gospel fully. And that was a really great reminder for me too, to really do some introspection, to make sure that I am showing them this is happiness. This is lasting joy. And you can see it in me, you know, by my fruit. Mm, I really like that. And she says, after she talks about, um, you know, partaking again and again, that's when she says, she talks, she says, perhaps our greatest work will be with our loved ones. Our hope changes the way they see themselves and who they really are. I want to go back up to the top of the talk, if we can, for just a second. And I wanted to ask you guys a question. Um, and this isn't like, guess what's in my head. I just have a question. She says, when I focused on the savior, uh, they felt joy and knew this truth because of Christ. Um, it all works out. She was referencing some scriptures before this about having an eye of faith. Um, and then she said, everything you and you and you are worried about. So everybody listening and us here, (laughs) it's all going to be okay. And those who look with an eye of faith can feel that it's going to be okay now. I thought the word um, feel was interesting here. So looking with an eye of faith can lead to feeling. And what does that even mean? How do we feel that things are going to be okay um, when looking at an overview lens? That was kind of my question as I studied. Well, so I think it's really powerful. And this is why I loved this talk and as it accompanied President Nelson's Think Celestial, because his using the word think celestial felt very intentional. I think he's very careful with his words. And then when she did, it stood out to me that she talked about feeling that everything's going to be okay because truly our thoughts influence our emotions. And then, and it took me immediately back to when Peter is in the storm and Christ is walking on the water. And I have this painting in my room and I've had a lot of challenges. Well, haven't we all in my life in general, but I feel like I've had a little concentration of them over the past couple of years. And so um, my husband and I intentionally purchased our favorite depiction of the story of Peter 
walking on the water towards the savior. And the one that we actually chose is the one where the savior's in the forefront, surrounded in light on a dark, stormy ocean. And the boat with the apostles is kind of off in the distance because that is the goal. The goal is focus on him. Um, because if we do start to look around at the tumult in our lives, in the world, all the things, it can be very easy to not feel like things are going to be okay. <laughs> it can be very easy to get distracted by the heaviness of what's going on in our life, personal lives, and what's going on in the world at large. Um, but as soon as in this these trials that I've been experiencing, I would look at that painting and I would be so intentional about, nope, eyes focused on the savior. And how does that make me feel when I picture the savior and I, and I know his attributes, I know his power, I know his love for me. I know what he's willing to do for me. And I know he is, he's powerful and mighty to do all the things I need him to do. And as soon as I would focus my thoughts on him, the feeling would immediately shift inside of me. That anxiety and that panic that would start to swell up would immediately be squelched. And I thought, you know, that is so important. We have to take our thoughts captive so that our emotions can follow suit. And focusing on the Savior is everything. Um, and it can be an immediate shift. And it's just um, so I and I so identify with Peter. He's one of my favorites <laughs> um, because I feel like I feel like him so often, like I have this bold faith, but then I get shaky. <laughs> you know, like I st- I will step out of the boat, but I will totally also sink in the water. So, um, but man, how amazing it is to be able to shift those feelings with focusing on Him. Sorry, I know I just talked before this, but I'm going to jump in really quick because I had this experience today. I went to wash my car, and my daughter is terrified of car washes. She turns two on Saturday. Um, So every time we go in the car wash, I'm trying to figure out how to help her (laughs) not be scared. And um, this time, my mom was actually on FaceTime, and so I handed my mom the phone, and she was on FaceTime with her Nana, and then obviously I'm in the front of the car (laughs) driving it. And I was holding her hand, looking back at her because, you know, I don't have to drive the car. I'm being moved along and I'm looking back at her and she's starting to look around. I noticed she's looking out the window. She's seeing the the soap come on and the things run around the side of the car. And every time she looked at them, she would get scared. Obviously, she's a, she's a toddler. But every time I focused her attention either back to her Nana or to me, she would stop. And she would feel okay. And I thought that was so interesting. And it taught me in that moment to always be looking to my heavenly father and Jesus Christ, just like you said, Tammy, and with the example of Peter. And I just, I just had to share that experience because I think sometimes I'm that little kid in the car seat looking at everything going on around me. (laughs) And if I just focused back in, I would be okay. Right. And it's a lesson we can all learn. And I think we do better sometimes, or we do better sometimes rather than other times. And that's okay. We just need to keep going to where we're better, you know, more and more of the time because we learn from experience. So just had to throw that out there real quick because I just had this experience today. So definitely expedient. (laughs) What is it about kids and car washes? All of my toddlers were terrified. And then eventually they start to cheer and be like, yay. But not at that age, like two or three, their eyes are like stunned and scared. So yeah, but I love that analogy. It's perfect. Yeah, I love that analogy too, because it just get like just thinking of the analogy and the, the experience that you had, because in our on our lives, like the outside world, you know, we have social media, we have everything going around us. It's so noisy. And that's just like the car wash. The car wash is noisy. There's different lights, different things happening around us. And like we can get drawn into them, you know, whether it's politics or whether it's um, contentions with family or whether it's, you know, whatever things that might take us away from um, what God would want us to be focused on. And it can get scary. You can you can start losing hope <laughs> because you're like, oh my gosh, is this world really going to get worse? Because I don't know if I can handle much more. But then Heavenly Father, He doesn't, He, he works, his, the way He speaks to us is through our feelings. Right. So when we're, when we refocus our lens, when we re refocus on him, we, even with everything going on, the stuff going on around us, we can't control what we can control is where we're focused and how we're going to react to the, to the outside world versus what our, our ultimate goal is. Right. And so 
when we are able to reposition our focus on Heavenly Father and have that eye of faith, He then works through the Holy Ghost and gives us those feelings of hope, those feelings of peace, those feelings of calmness in this storm of the world that we're in. We can still have that peace and, and calmness. Yeah, like President Nelson said, the joy in our lives has little to do with the circumstances and everything to do with the focus. And then she said, with an eye focused on the Savior, we can feel joy because of Christ, it all works out, right? And we don't need to try to figure out how it's going to work out. Um, You know, we just get to trust Him and practice increasing in that faith and trust. Because as we do, we can shut down the worry. We can shut down the panic. We can shut down the anxiety. Um, All the things, you know, they talk about like anger is a secondary emotion. It's almost always rooted in fear. Um, And how often do the scriptures tell us to fear not? Um, And then, um, and why? Because Because of the Savior, we have nothing to fear. Yeah. I also wanted to add to this analogy real quick. I forgot to say this earlier, and it went perfect with what you said, Shelby. Uh, Every time when I was in the car wash, I would I would start to cry or get scared. I would say, "Look at mommy! Look at mommy! Mommy's right here! Look at mommy!" And then I thought, how often is the Savior trying to tell us, "Look at me! Look at me! I'm right here! Come, turn to me! I'm right here!" And um, in her in Sister Runia's talk, she says, "Because we are children of the covenant." right? Because we've made covenants, we can ask for this hopeful feeling now. And I thought that was so, in that moment, I also connected this back to, I can look at him through my covenants that I've made. I can look at him through the promises and the blessings that have been given to me and know that there is hope and I can feel it right now. I don't have to wait for it. I can feel that feeling now. And so going back to the analogy of my daughter, not that I'm Jesus Christ or anything. I'm not saying that, but I'm not feeling of hope that mom's going to get me out of here (laughs) and go ahead. And she can look and focus on that and feel that feeling now in this analogy rather than feeling fear in the moment. And so I just love this, that our covenants are ways that we can look at him and commandments are ways that we can see him calling to us saying, look at me, follow me, right? Come follow me. It's, it's right there in the scriptures. (laughs) Yeah. And she says later on in the talk, I think this kind of like goes really well with what you were just saying. Having this eye of faith now is a recapturing or an echo of the faith we had before we came to this planet. That's so cool. That's really beautiful. <laughs> and it really is like, um, I, I love those, those thoughts of that echo and the ability that we have to reconnect and know that we had faith and trust in the Savior to fulfill His mission perfectly. We chose Him. We followed Him. We followed Him here, knowing that this world would be full of uncertainty and scary things. Maybe we were a little bit naive, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> we, I don't know if we really fully understood how fun it was going to be once we got here, but I just know like we chose him and it, and it does feel like a memory sometimes when we recommit ourselves to, um, to being a disciple of Jesus Christ and trusting him. We trusted him and we should trust him now. And he has fulfilled his mission perfectly. And there's so much power in the atonement of Jesus Christ that we can access. So that's just such a beautiful way that she put that. I love that. It's also really powerful too, to think about that it's a reflection of faith we had once had before. It gives us some insight into what our spirits may have been like before we came here. Right. And I always, I always think that's powerful to think about who was I, what kind of spirit was I and how valiant was I, right? Was I trying to help people? Was I, what was I doing? And so I, that's kind of a thing that I like to study too. And so I just think that's powerful to know that it's a reflection of that. And And I love that she says too, in the talk, she says, it is my witness that the Savior has the ability because of his atonement to turn any nightmare you're going through into a blessing. He has given us a promise with an immutable covenant. And this is quoting Doctrine and Covenants, that as we strive to love and follow him, all things wherewith we have been afflicted shall work together for our good. And she reiterates all things, which can be really hard to feel in the moment Um, that the most difficult, painful, agonizing, frightening things that we experience here will absolutely work together for our good. But that is a promise 
um, that it will. And to be able to look at our afflictions a little differently, that as we are thinking celestial, thinking eternally, zooming out and looking with that overview lens um, to see that these really difficult things that we encounter are what draw us to the Savior in the first place. And it is being drawn to Him time and time again as we repent continually, uh, hopefully repent relentlessly, you know, every moment of the day that as we turn to Him and even even repenting for our fear that like I'm in this very difficult situation and this is hard. And the first emotion that's coming to the surface, Lord, is fear and repenting of the fear because I know I shouldn't hold on to this. I know I can trust you and I repent and I hand that over to you and then allow him to shift that for us. And, um, and just to just know we are becoming, we are becoming more. It's oil in the lamp. We wouldn't be able to become what we need to become without these afflictions. And we have to just trust him that he sees the bigger picture. And so, and we sometimes don't. And so sometimes the overview lens is just trusting that he has the perfect vantage point. Yeah. And having, going through trials and hardships and stuff is a great way for us to be able to refocus our, our lens or like to zoom out and not be so zoomed in. Cause when we zoom in, it can create panic, right? And panic is created by Satan. Heavenly father doesn't create panic. That's from Satan himself. And so when we turn to the Lord and then, you know, we get those promptings to just like calm down, let's take a step back. You step back, you view from a broader lens, then we're, that's where we're able to be filled with more hope because we're able to better see things from his viewpoint. And I thought it was, I, I just, I just, how cool is it that like, well, yeah, Heavenly Father, he sees all. He knows exactly what's going to happen. He knows all the hard things that are going to happen in this world and to come and before Christ comes again. Yet he is still filled with hope. He still has hope. And if he has hope knowing everything that's going to happen, and when even in our zoomed in times where we don't even know what's going to happen, we can't even see five feet in front of us because we're so fixated on these issues that we, we may be experiencing, for him to have hope with the vastness of the world, it just reminds me that I can always have hope in the hardest of times. I would also add to that. That that part of our trials, right? Finding that hope in that moment that if Christ can do that, we can. Another part of our trials, I think, and afflictions, even in our families, right? That we're talking about in this family view. Um, she says, uh, we can stay at the tree and partake of the fruit with a smile on our face, letting the light of Christ in our eyes become something others can count on in the darkest hours. So I feel that a lot of the times, and I'm sure I've heard some of your guys' stories of trials too. Um, that when you are in your darkest hours, those are those are the times when you come out and you find that hope that you can relate so well to other people and be that light for Him, for Jesus Christ, right? And I think that's another element here of staying at the tree and beckoning people to come is, I went through that dark thing and I stayed at the tree, please stay with me and I can relate to you here because I went through the same thing or I went through something very similar, right? And I think that's a powerful effect of this as well. Yes, I completely agree. It reminds me of a note that I made back at the beginning of the talk, but it goes really well with what you just said, where she talks about viewing from a new vantage point changes everything. And I put on the side, I said, being able to view things at a new vantage point can help us have more love and compassion for others. So being able to have that overview lens, overview effect, and let Christ's light shine will allow us to expand or um, give out. What's the word I'm looking for? Um, share, I guess, give, yeah, share, or give love and compassion towards others. And they can feel, they can feel Christ's love when we do that. And I think too, I, I, I you guys have may have heard before. I know I have, and I love that, um, where your trial is, there is your ministry. And where your struggle is, there is your ministry. And so, you know, from our past, we can look back and say, okay, our family overcame this really hard thing, or I personally overcame this really hard thing. And now I'm in a position to minister to others. Like just like you said, Shelby, about like I I I've been where you're at or in some similar situation and I stood by the tree and this is how my faith got me through what I went through. 
Um, but then it also is a reminder to us when the next storm comes in, because I'm sure you've also heard we're either walking into a storm, we're in the middle of a storm, or we're just coming out of the storm. We're in one of those three places. And so as soon as you come out of a storm, you anticipate there will be another. You will be walking into another storm at some point, right? And so it reminds you that when you come into these difficult situations, when our loved ones walk into these difficult situations, that there is Im- are important lessons that will be learned and vantage point that will be gained that will allow them to serve us to serve. And, and like you said, Shelby Christensen, to be able to have more compassion and, and patience with ourselves, with our family and all the ways, uh, you know, uh, anyway, it's just such a beautiful thing to be able to offer that after you've experienced something hard. And it's, it's, you know, why we're a human family, right? So we can serve and lift one another, which she also references in this talk about, you know, like a rising tide lifts all the boats, right? Um, as we serve and lift one another. And I love when she said, if you want to get there quickly, go alone, you know? Um, but, uh, what is it? Oh gosh. Can you guys help me find that quote really quickly? It was so good. I just remember, but if you want to, what was it? If you want to go fast, go alone. Right. But if you want to go far, go together because it's with that rising tide that lifts all the boats. And so I certainly do. I want to go far and I certainly don't want to be alone at the end of the race. I want my loved ones with me. I want to be together with my family. And, um, yeah, I just love that vantage point as well. It was so cool. This has been such a beautiful discussion. I've loved hearing your guys' thoughts. I knew this was going to be so good. We, For our listeners who are still here, Tammy, Shelby, and me, Shelby, all met on an Inklings chat. And so we've just been talking to each other for like almost a year now, and it's been awesome. <laughs> and so I just knew we were going to have such a wonderful discussion here. Um, before we wrap up, is there any last thoughts that we want to share from this talk? I don't mean to talk so much, but I do. I have one more thing. I loved this part because it gives me hope in my imperfections. Um, I was just vulnerable with both of the Shelby's here that things weren't perfect in my house tonight, right before getting on to talk about this talk. And, um, and it, we can be so hard on ourselves. And I know that there are perfectionist tendencies abound because of social media and the ability we have to constantly compare ourselves on our worst day to everyone else on their best day. Um, and so this quote was when I highlighted like, and then re-highlighted for myself. And it says, let's admit in a fallen world, there's no way to be a perfect spouse, parent, son or daughter, grandchild, mentor, or friend, but a million ways to be a good one. Let's stay at the tree or take of the love of God and share it by lifting the people around us. We ascend together. And I needed that reminder. Perfection is not needed. (laughs) It is not necessary. It is not expected. And yet we can still be good spouses, parents, brothers, sisters, friends, mentors, all the things. And um, that is so comforting to me. And I needed that reminder from this talk. Thank you so much for that, Tammy. And one thing that I wanted to add to that is towards the end of her talk, just the one quote that she quotes. Um, it sa- she says, no home is a failure unless it quits trying. So as long as we keep trying, as long as we keep repenting and partake over and over and over of the fruit and keep readjusting our lens, viewing out, trusting in God and allowing him to fill us with those feelings of peace and love, then we're, n- we're not going to fail. We're not going to fail. I love that. I love that. And I also love that she says, we can do this. We can hold on and hope on. <laughs> and she was being our cheerleader there and we needed that. <laughs> I love it. I, I I will just end too with, I love, there was one thing that she said, love is the thing that changes parts. And that's just such a powerful thing to think about. And the most of the time, I know we talked about how our words um Obviously, it can impact others, even ourselves. But most of the time, we also remember how we feel more than what was said. And I think that's important here to remember with love is that we can display it through our actions and through living. And we don't really have to say anything. We can just show our love. And while it is great to hear, I love you, um, I think that's important as well. But I think more often than not, we're probably acting and doing things that show our love more than actually saying it uh, word for word. So 
just remembering that that's the thing that changes hearts eventually and remembering that love that you had. Um, and we can all need that or, and we all need that, right? Because we, or we all need that hope. Um, as you said, when she said, let's admit no one's perfect here. So such a good, such a good last little, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Such a good last little bit of advice here and doctrine from Sister Arunia. <laughs> All right, y'all. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Conference Talk podcast. This episode, we discussed Sister Tamara Runia's talk, Seeing God's Family Through the Overview Lens. If you enjoyed this episode, give us a five-star rating. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, and everywhere you get podcasts. You can find links to all our podcast platforms on our website, conferencetalk.org. ConferenceTalk.org is also where you can follow us on social media, drop us a comment, check out the show notes, and find the resources we mentioned in the episode, and learn more about us, your host. If you want to follow me, Shelby Christensen, you can find me on Instagram at ShelbC08, and my husband and I also have a podcast called Olive Theory. And if you want to follow me, you can follow uh, my husband and I. We do a podcast called The Book of Mormon Podcast, so... It's just at the Book of Mormon podcast. And Tammy, if people want to follow you, where can they follow you at? They can find me on Instagram as whole made mama and learn a little bit about my story as to why I'm called, call myself the whole made mama after a long journey with infertility. And that's W H O L E made M A M A. Perfect. And we will have links for those down in the show notes. But while we always appreciate new followers, it's better to follow the prophet and the apostles themselves. Yep. Although we love speaking about the church and our leaders, we do not speak for them. Everything said on this podcast represents our own personal opinions. Join us next week for some more personal opinions next week on the Conference Talk podcast.